everyone. Thank you so much to the organizers for having me. Really excited to be speaking here today. My name is Audrey Pe, and I'm the founder and executive director of WeTech, which is short for Women in Technology. WeTech is a global youth-led nonprofit organization based in the Philippines, but with 20 chapters spread out across 10 countries around the world that aims to educate, inspire, and empower youth to break gender barriers and use tech to make a difference in society. When I'm not working on WeTech, I'm a freshman at Stanford University, where I intend to major in science, technology, and society with a minor in education. So how did I get here? How did I find myself running a nonprofit at the age of 19 while balancing a full academic school load? How did I start WeTech at 15 and manage to speak at places around the world and interact with students around the world as well that are passionate about gender equality and tech accessibility? My so story quite simply starts in a middle school computer classroom. I was born and raised in the Philippines, where under the local Philippine curriculum, we all have to take a mandatory computer class. Only this computer class doesn't have to do anything with programming. It's more on how to use platforms like Microsoft Office. Think about Word, PowerPoint, and Excel, which I didn't find too exciting until one day my teacher decided to go completely off curriculum and introduced us to this game where a snake had to navigate a maze using blocks that represented lines of code. I remember just being so excited and realizing for the first time in my life that the technology, social media, apps, etc., that I had pretty much used on a day-to-day -day basis were made using code and that I too could learn this mysterious language of computers and one day create my own apps and websites. With that thought, I asked my teacher if we would be learning more about programming in class. I was told, unfortunately, that because it isn't part of the Philippine curriculum, we wouldn't be touching programming any further. But my teacher said that if I really wanted to learn more about coding, I could go online and look up tutorials from there. And that's what I did for the rest of middle school and early high school. When I wasn't in clubs or studying for my classes, I was sat in front of my laptop Googling how to learn how to code or free computer science tutorials. I found websites like code.org wherein I had Anna and Elsa create snowflakes using blocks that represented lines of code. I went on YouTube and I found Harvard's introductory CS lectures from the Harvard CS50 series, all up there for free. And I also went on Codecademy and tried out their HTML, CSS, Java, JavaScript tutorials. I didn't spend anything in order to be able to access all of these resources. Come high school, I started getting asked the very scary question, what do you want to do with your future? What do you want to major in? Where do you want to study? To a lot of those questions, I responded that I wanted to go into the field of tech. I was met with a lot of mixed responses. My peers told me that they were surprised and that I was very brave for wanting to go into tech because in my entire ninth grade, I was the only girl that wanted to do so. According to the guys, they were surprised that I was into video games because to them, technology exclusively meant video games, whereas I was already thinking about tech for social good after watching TED Talks and reading articles about it. But the feedback that really hit me the hardest was when a teacher told me that she didn't think I would be a good fit for the tech industry. I thought about her words a lot and why my gut reaction was to agree with her. And I felt that way because when I thought of the big names in the tech industry, I thought of Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Elon Musk. I basically thought of middle-aged white guys that I have very little in common with as a then 15-year-old Filipina girl. So that got me thinking, where are the women in tech? Why don't I know their stories? They have to be out there somewhere, and I want to get to know them. So I simply Googled women in tech. And from there, I found a bunch of resources about the gender gap in the tech industry. I learned, according to the Philippine Startup Survey, women in tech comprise of or female founders of Philippine tech companies are only at 18%. According to Payscale, I also read that women in tech are paid 18 to 22% less than their male counterparts internationally, confirming my suspicions about the gender gap, not just in the Philippines, but also around the world. With that in mind, I, I think I could have, in hindsight, really seen those statistics and thought, okay, I'm 15 years old. I can easily just like go to a different career. I'm still young. But instead of getting intimidated by those statistics about the gender gap, I got really angry. I thought, why is it that just because of gender, men and women have different opportunities in tech? 
And why is it that just because of gender, men and women are treated differently, paid differently, given different opportunities, that sort of thing? With that in mind, I channeled all these frustrations that I had about the tech industry into forming WeTech, the Women in Tech blog. WeTech started as a blog that was used to feature the different stories of women in tech that I had found online. I would literally go on the hashtag women in tech on Instagram and LinkedIn. I would peruse the different profiles of women in biotech, in software engineering, and user experience, and I'd shoot them cold messages. And I'd say, hi, my name's Audrey, I'm 15, and I'm looking for role models in tech to feature on the WeTech blog in the hopes that more young girls like me can be inspired by stories like yours and find their way into the tech industry. While not everyone replied to my cold message, cold messages, a fair amount did, and those became the starting stories for the Women in Tech blog. One of my favorite interviewees was Alison Falk, a user experience developer from Pittsburgh that also completed her cybersecurity master's, I think, about a year or two ago. Allison inspired me and continues to inspire me so much, not just because of her interest in tech and her passion for it, but also because she's a part-time model. Prior to meeting her, I had a lot of preconceived notions about what it would be like to work in the tech industry. And when I thought of tech, I very much had this internalized stereotype about how people in tech looked and maybe acted a lot like Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory. Allison really challenged all of those stereotypes I had by proving to me that you don't need to just go into tech. You can combine it with other disciplines, like in her case, modeling, and you can be as feminine as you want in the tech industry. She taught me that being good at tech and being girly or feminine aren't mutu are not mutually exclusive and that you are really the only one that can define for yourself what kind of person you want to be in the tech industry. Hearing stories like Allison's really inspired me, but I couldn't help but think, is this enough? Is writing about these women in tech stories going to be concretely enough to create change in the gender gap, to create equality in the tech industry? I had this everlasting thought that what good is inspiration from these articles if it doesn't lead to concrete action? I think back to the climate action movement and that we can be inspired by the posts that we see online and we can share Instagram story after Instagram story about sustainability. But unless we actually do something to change our lifestyles, that won't be enough. We won't be creating concrete steps towards achieving climate action. So same logic goes for gender equality and the gender equality in tech movement specifically. How do we turn blog posts about inspiring women in tech into concrete ways to actually close the gender gap in tech? That's what really marked the shift in WeTech from a blog into a community organization that hosted the first Women in Tech conference for students and by students in the Philippines. I remember being at a hackathon, I think, during the summer of my sophomore year of high school and just noting like many of the other hackathons that I've been to before that all the speakers, judges, and mentors at the event were men. And that really tripped me up because it got me thinking, how are we supposed to create a more gender equal space to encourage more young girls to go into tech when the role models and opportunities being presented to us were just so male oriented? So I joked to a couple of friends there, a couple of a small group of girls there, why don't we start our own tech conference with speakers and judges and mentors that are women. So we can celebrate the achievements of women in tech and create a safe and inclusive space for more young women to engage with the tech industry. And with that, the Women in Tech Conference, WITCON was born. It was inspired largely by the Grace Hopper Conference in the United States and seeing opportunities like that accessible here in the US, but not so much in places like the Philippines and Southeast Asia. WITCON was a one day event that brought together speakers, judges and mentors uh, from different facets of tech and young girls, guys, and literally anybody, people of all genders that wanted to learn about the achievements of women in tech. We made a deliberate decision not to limit our team recruitment and our event to women because we really wanted to acknowledge that men need to be active participants and allies in the fight for gender equality. I like to think of it this way. In a 50-50 tech workspace, men aren't, aren't just going to disappear from the conversation. They're going to be part of that other 50% allies really that need to call out incidents of sexism and correct other people whether it's women men or those not identifying as a gender binary we need to be able to correct everybody of the microaggressions that a lot of women in tech face so it's really an ongoing work in progress this fight for gender equality but at its core what you really wanted to foster at WeTech was a safe space for anybody regardless of their gender or socioeconomic status to go into tech and use it to make a difference in the world 
given this really core value and core thought of equality, we couldn't help but notice that most of the participants at the Women in Tech conference came from middle to upper class backgrounds and that they could go home, look up a serious tutorial like I did, and engage with tech from there. And in the Philippines, a country we're in, it is still very much a developing country and many live below the poverty line. We knew that simply by having that internet access, by being able to do something like hop on a Zoom call like this, it is inherently a privilege. So we sought out to bring tech to low-income communities that otherwise would not have had access to technology resources and curriculum. And that was how the Women in Tech Teach program was born. Back in 2018, we went to a southern part of the Philippines called Marawi that was bombed in 2017 due to suspected terrorists. We taught students living in evacuation centers, basic Microsoft Office, brought them laptops, and many of the students had never used the laptop before. So we taught them how to turn it on, use the keys, that sort of thing. It was a humbling experience, and it taught me a lot about how, personally, my peers and I, growing up, took a lot of the technology that we had relatively consistent access to for granted. And I think during the pandemic as well, it's a very timely thought to think about how not everybody gets this bare minimum access that is technology. At WeTech, we are really working towards building a world where all youth, regardless of their gender or socioeconomic status, have access to tech and the opportunity to use technology to solve problems within their community. And that starts with making sure that every student has access to that technology, to the curriculum to be able to learn it, to the resources to be able to apply it to their day-to-day -day lives. It's a tough battle. It's not something that's going to be solved immediately or maybe even in the next couple of years or so. It's going to need to take an active effort, an active effort to realize our privileges of having this piece of technology, our active effort of doing something, of being proactive about starting conversations about the tech access gap. And I think if there's anything I've learned within my almost five years of running WeTech as founder and executive director, it's that the best thing I think that anybody can wish for their nonprofit is for it to become irrelevant in the future for the problem that they started their nonprofit for in the first place to one day be solved. So that's where we're going with VTech, really building a more equal future in terms of tech. And this pandemic has really made us as a team think a lot about the ways in which technology is just inherently intertwined with education. Education as a human right, therefore technology must also be a human right because it is giving so many of us now access to education, which not everybody around the world has. If there's anything that you take away from my story, I also hope it's that you don't need to wait until you grow up, until you graduate, work a couple of years before making a difference. I was raised to believe that I had to go through this solid couple of steps of working before, working, graduating, thinking about all these things before, thinking about how to make a difference in my community. But if you feel so strongly about a topic, if you feel so strongly about a problem in your community that you almost can't sleep at night because you're so taken by it and want to learn more, I suggest that you channel that energy into creating something, anything that you can help solve that problem. With WeTech, there were just so many nights where I felt like I couldn't sleep because I was so invested in the problem and wanted to learn more. Nights of Googling women in tech, tech accessibility barriers, Wi-Fi resources in low-income communities. Those were the things that I did that bit by bit shaped VTech into what it is today. But it's not just me working on it. It's a team of over 250 individuals from around the world, from 10 different countries, that are all so invested in making sure that we build a more equal future using technology. VTech wouldn't be where it is now without all of our incredible members, our chapter coordinators, our chapter heads. And I'm optimistic even given the statistics about students dropping out of the Philippine public school system due to the lack of technology equipment needed for the education, even due to more sobering news about the lack of students from other parts of the world that don't get access to tech and therefore don't have access to an education. I'm optimistic because I see the power of young people to engage, to ask questions, and to fight against the inequalities that persist in our day-to-day -day lives. So thank you so much for listening to my story, and I hope that it's inspired you or you've taken something away from it, even if it's just the responsibility and just the realization that the bare minimum access that you have to technology that enables you to listen to this talk here today is a privilege. I know that with that privilege comes the opportunity to use it wisely. Thank you so much.